Good morning and welcome everyone to today's Southern Fire Exchange webinar. My name is David Godwin and I am the Outreach Coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. Today we're excited to have our guest speaker Randy Swati, ecologist with the Nature Conservancy. Today Randy will be giving a presentation introducing state and transition models and providing examples of how they can be used and developed to support management and restoration programs. I'd like to take this opportunity to share a little bit of information about the Southern Fire Exchange. SFE is a regional program for fire science delivery in the southeast and we're funded by the Joint Fire Science Program. Our mission is to increase the availability and application of fire science information for resource management and to serve as a conduit for fire managers to share re new research needs with the research community. For more information you can see our website right there southernfireexchange.org and then really the best way to stay connected with us and, and to learn about our upcoming webinars like this one, uh, our field tours, our presentations, our fact sheets, and other products is by joining our email list, uh, which you can do by, by clicking right there on the, on the box in the middle of your screen. Randy Swati, our guest today, he's originally from Little Rock, Arkansas. He earned his BS and MS at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff. His scientific specialties span spatial scales, ranging, ranging from genetics uh, to mycorrhizae ecology and all the way up to landscape scale planning. Formerly, he served as Michigan's forest ecologist, working with large landowners to, pro to promote sustainable management. Currently, Randy works to develop vegetation models and to apply land fire products within and outside of the conservancy. He lives and works in Marquette, Michigan. And one moment here as we change slideshows and get things set up for Randy to go. Glad you're with us today. And um, as David mentioned, please um, type any questions or comments you have in the chat window. I'll be following those, and so will David, so that we can um, adjust things along the way. I'm going to go over um, why models, maybe try to address that for you. I'll be going into the land fire models a fair bit. I'll do a brief demonstration of the modeling software we use called STSIM, go over a couple quick examples of model use, and um, talk about a uh, model review process we've got planned. So um, thanks again. David and I kind of envisioned this as an informal demo, so I'll be switching applications um, going into the software and into a database. So again, please stop me if something is confusing or if your um, screen is slow to load and, and you're kind of getting lost in the shuffle, but I'll try to go slow. So thanks again, and off we go. So if you're like me, the term model either conjures up a clothing catalog or a postdoc toiling away in a cubicle somewhere parameterizing, whatever that is. I was first introduced to models in the best way, at least for me, through crayons and paper. In the early days of the Fire Learning Network, landscapes tried to understand how their ecosystems worked by literally drawing conceptual models with boxes for ecosystem serial states and lines for succession or disturbances. By doing so, we made and documented assumptions, documented the bounds of each serial state or succession class, such as their age, canopy cover, etc. Then we tried to understand how much, how much of each serial state or succession class would have been on the landscape during a particular time period, say pre-European settlement or maybe 50 years ago, based on the disturbance regimes of that time period. So with that, a couple quotes that you may have seen before, and I think they're very applicable to this activity called modeling. So why models? Um, a couple slides on that and a couple stories. Um, in a very lucky chapter in my ecological experience modeling in Guatemala, I was able to do a little bit of this type of work with um, colleagues there. The goal was to understand how the pine ecosystems of the highland area of Guatemala worked historically, now, and perhaps into the future. We first gathered experts together and drew out the ecosystem dynamics that you see in this picture simply on a whiteboard. And we also took notes um, on a computer. I then came back to the United States with these pictures and my notes, transferred the information into PowerPoint slides, 
and then working with partners via Skype, move that information into modeling software. The beauty of the process was that we documented what the experts knew and what information was lacking. We also set the managers up to model current conditions and then to play with how they might take the current conditions into a desired future condition through control burning or through invasives control or through not logging or what have you. It was a great way to gather ecological knowledge from the experts that had not been documented very well before, document it and set them up for testing management alternatives. All right, and another quick story from the Western United States. If you look at this picture carefully, you'll notice some clustering. It's kind of interesting. You'll see the fire managers in the foreground um, talking fire management and risks and all those things. There were Native Americans. There are ranchers clustered together, the environmentalists. And behind them were all the agency employees, all the agency managers and planners and botanists. Um, and so in this area, um, everybody had different desires for a landscape, and it made it very difficult to do anything. The ranchers happened to like to see invasive cheatgrass because it greened up first in the spring, providing great forage for their cows. The environmentalists in this situation wanted the managers to do nothing. Fire managers dedicate their lives to protecting resources, ecological, social, and economic, and were worried about doing nothing. Um, so in this situation, we may go in and do collaborative modeling, working together to test everyone's ideas. It's maybe my favorite example of geeks and models bringing people together. Um, it's great to go into computer space and play and test everyone's assumptions. So if done right and at the right time, modeling can serve as a collaborative learning activity. So now onto this thing called land fire, which is sort of the, the springboard for the modeling I'll discuss. I assume many of you know what land fire is, so just a couple quick slides on this. So briefly, what is land fire? Um, it's a partnership. This official statement captures part of the community that makes up land fire as academics, consultants, students, NGOs, in addition to the federal agencies, are all involved, all contributing, and, and many state DNRs as well. Here you see maps. Landfire delivers roughly two dozen spatial data sets that span the country and the insular islands, if you're lucky enough to work on some of those, in some of those places. Um, and you see a picture of a model down in the far left. We'll talk about that more, but this is only part of the story. Landfire is about the people, ideas, and making the most of current products available to us. Um, Landfire is a great toolbox, but it's not complete for, for what you need to do. You always have to bring in expert knowledge, other tools, other data sets. And so Landfire works with you to try to help you integrate the best of what you have to make your decisions. Also note the word vegetation. While named Landfire, the program is not only about solving fire-related issues, but also about broader vegetation and values that are connected to it. I want to separate out <coughs> excuse me, this idea of the spatial data sets that might go into ArcMap from the aspatial models and descriptions that we'll be talking about today. In 2004, the Nature Conservancy signed a cooperative agreement to describe and model what we call reference conditions for the ecosystems of the United States. Ten years ago, it was, it's amazing. So these reference conditions sort of speak to how the ecosystems of the United States would have looked and worked prior to major European settlement. To do this, we ran dozens of workshops with hundreds of experts, including some of you guys, who first described the ecosystems, then modeled the disturbances to get an estimate of how much of each developmental stage or succession class will be on the landscape. These descriptions and models were then reviewed, QA, QC'd, and are available to you at that link below. We'll provide these links to you later so you don't have to scramble and try to get them right now. So. I'm going to show you more about this, but here's sort of an intro slide. So each model is sort of captured in two places, in the modeling software that I'll show you, 
and also in a database that can then be printed out um, as a PDF file. And here's a picture of that here. So each model, um, whether you're modeling with land fire or in the future, needs to be documented. And that's what we did here in these descriptions. You can access these um, descriptions as PDF files, as I mentioned, and also in an access database that I'm going to open up and show you. Also, uh, a couple bits of vocabulary for you. Um, in Lampfire, the original modeling was done in Vegetation Dynamics Development Tool called VDDT. VDDT still exists and it's available from ESSA Technologies. However, um, we now use a software called STSIM available from Apex RMS. That has a little more functionality and sets us up a little better to do climate change work and it also has some spatial modeling capacity. So you'll get a good dose of all that today, but I want to introduce those names to you um, with this slide. The reason we did, <laughs> excuse me, all the modeling originally was so that we could figure out how much of each succession class would have been on the landscape historically to compare to conditions today. So you'll see sort of a visual representation of this in this Ozark Oak Woodland example. So we had five succession classes, herbaceous, shrub open, shrub closed, tree open, and tree closed, defined by canopy height, canopy closure amount, and the species there. And you'll see the light gray bars represent our modeled sort of expected amount of each succession class that would have been in these succession, successional stages historically. And as you might hypothesize, because of the fire regime in this oak woodland, you get mostly open canopy um, structure. However, today, presumably due to fire suppression, most of this Ozark oak woodland is in the um, tree closed succession class, which is detrimental to many of the understory flora and to collared lizards, for example. So I, I want to say um, something I'll repeat a few times today. While we present this example of reference conditions versus current, we're not here to say that reference conditions are necessarily desired future conditions. And these models are not aimed necessarily at telling you what to do, where, or when, but they set the context and give you information in which to make decisions. So here I am in my office. This is the best I can do for you, show you a picture of what it's like. Um, and now I am going to open the descriptions in Microsoft Access, give you a tour of that, then open STSIM. And again, um, I'll be watching the chat window. So if something gets lost, um, let me know via the chat or David, stop me at any time. David and I practiced this a few times and it worked well, but you, you never know when it's live, how it's going to go. So here we go. I'm going to give you a moment to, um, to watch this and hopefully it'll pop up quickly for you. And I'm going to open up my chat window, see if you type any questions for me. No questions. And you can, everybody in the so audience, far, no comment. you can make that window in the upper part of your screen full screen by clicking on those um, kind of outward facing arrows. And that way you can get a full screen view of what he's working on. Thanks, David. Great point. So today I'm going to give you a tour of this southern and central Appalachian Cove forest. I'm doing this for a couple reasons. One, it's a great description and model by a very credible ecologist named Milo Pine, who may be on the call today. I don't know. I, I didn't check all the participants, but he's uh, an ecologist with NatureServe. And the last I spoke to me is Loki C. And also, I'm going to show you this because I have a, a model queued up as well that we'll explore. So in this particular screen here, this general tab, you see basic descriptive information for the southern and central Appalachian Cove Forest. For this area that we call Map Zone 61, Area 61 maybe you might think, um, for uh, an area in the eastern United States. We had roughly 22 of these descriptions and models, and this happens to be one that 
is of particular interest to me, so I'll dig into it. You see the geographic range, disturbance description, biophysical site description, which, which sort of describes where this ecosystem would be. And the disturbance description I'll, I'll mention is for reference conditions. So there, you would not find logging, invasive species, fire suppression, or anything like that there. This is all about pre-European settlement or reference conditions. On the classes tab, we'll find the information that's relevant to our modeling. So there are up to five succession classes for each model, labeled A through E. The black text we entered in, that is Milo Pine in this example, or it could have been anyone. A description, you'll see indicator species such as sugar maple and yellow birch. You'll see canopy height and closure on the right. And these um, parameters here are used to map these succession classes on the landscape today. We did not map where they were historically, assuming they would move around as, as disturbance sort of created the mosaic of these ecosystems. In the green, you'll see a percent. This is the percent from the modeling software for the different succession classes. So for this southern and central Appalachian cove forest, most of this ecosystem would have been in these closed canopy succession classes, such as this mid seral closed development class or in class D. So with that we get sort of our description and our background for the model and we can read and understand what the modeler was thinking about when did this work. You can also click on disturbances to get information on the fire frequency and severity and then you'll see check boxes where there are other disturbances modeled, though you don't get the specific information like you do for fires. Also, you can click on relevant literature and find the sources for the information that Milo Pine or who are modeling got their information. So with that, I am going to um, move into the next application. And you'll see a bit of shifting here for a moment. There's probably a smoother way to do this, but um, this seemed to be the, the most surefire way. I'm going to go into SynchroSim, or otherwise known as STSim. So STSim stands for State and Transition Simulator. So this was new language to me, but um, the states are the boxes, and they represent the succession class. And then the... The transitions are the disturbances or the succession pathways that happen within an ecosystem. So you'll see for each one of the gray boxes, there's a label, early one, mid one, and so on. You get a very generic canopy closure label of all, closed, or open. And then you see the years that are associated with each succession class. So basically, if we open this up, we find, <coughs> excuse me, the disturbance and succession information. So if this class A, which were the young sugar maples and yellow birches, if I remember right, if they um, make it nine years without some sort of a mixed fire or a placement fire, they move on to class B. You'll note, as expected for this cove forest, there's not a whole lot of fire. What we did to parameterize the models was we would enter in the transition type. Here's mixed fire, and that would mean between 25 and 75 percent canopy death with a fire. Then we entered in the annual probability. This sort of equates to area as well. So it would be 0.7 percent of this succession class would experience mixed fire every year. You could also do the math and get a um, return interval. But suffice it to say, as expected, the modeler Milo Pine felt that mixed fire and replacement were fairly rare in this succession class. You also define what happens when you have the replacement or mixed fire. And in this case, it's very easy. If you have a fire in this first succession class, 
it simply turns it back. And if it's a replacement fire, it sets the age of that stand back nine years. So it's fairly simple conceptually to do this modeling. Um, there, there are a lot, there's a lot of functionality and you could spend, I'm sure, a decade learning all the nuances of the software, but to basically build a model and set up the basic framework is fairly simple. The hard part is, is oftentimes coming up with the information to put into the model. I'm going to open up a couple other boxes just for to show you what they look like. This is the, the late one open succession class, so it's more open canopy, and you'll notice that there's uh, again, a relatively rare replacement fire, relatively rare wind weather stress, and relatively rare surface fire. So again, um, not much disturbed of in this ecosystem, in this cove forest type. And I'll let you kind of digest this for a moment. And you'll also see that if this late one open class is not affected by replacement fire, wind, weather, stress, or surface fire, it moves on to the late one closed canopy, which makes sense. If there's not a disturbance in an open canopy cove forest, it'll fill in and the canopy will close up. And so we move that pixel from the open succession class to a closed succession class. You'll also note that if you have a surface fire, um, it may kill some of those trees and it'll move the, this um, pixel of the late open just kind of loop it around. That is, it will not allow that pixel or acre, in this case possibly, to succeed onto the closed canopy. So it's probabilistic, meaning we put in a probability for each disturbance and um, you just build it out this way, adding disturbances as needed. So that is the, the land fire reference condition model. The, and that was fun enough. I enjoyed doing this with experts, and it was a great way, again, to learn about these ecosystems. But I wanted to um, tell you about what's happening with this model now. In several um, sites across the, the, the Appalachian region, um, different agencies and experts are reviewing these models. You know, we, we I, I think it's a fan, it was a fantastic effort, and we have this, what I would call, encyclopedia of ecosystems for the United States, but we are very keen to, to review and improve these models, and that's what's happening. So for this particular model, um, um, we held some workshops in the east, in the central Appalachians, and um, made some adjustments. For example... The experts there added an older growth stage that was not present in the land fire model, and I've highlighted it here, to kind of split out the, the late one closed canopy forest type. They did this to represent ecology as they knew it and to, and to also match up with forest management plans there, which may have designated an old growth succession class. So they needed to split it out to match inventory data and their planning needs. So they added the box, the succession class, and they added the disturbances and succession pathways to make it work. So the green lines that go in and out of the sides of the boxes denote succession. So the late one class would succeed to the late two class at 140 years if there's not a disturbance. So that's basically how this model works. And um, it looks like they've, they added some disturbances as well. Maybe they had some new information on insects and disease, which they've added in here. And they've probably just been a little more thorough than we had time to do with the original land fire modeling. You'll note that they added um, a couple wind weather stress events. So wind weather stress could really open up the canopy that is, take it from this older growth stage to the first succession class, that early zero to nine year old succession class, or it could, or it could kind of loop it around in the same succession class if it wasn't as big of an event. So um, I hope that this gives you a flavor for how this works. 
the inputs that you may need to build your own models or move a model. And in what we're doing with these models now, that is we're taking, in some places around the country, we're improving the reference condition models to better line up with manager needs. So with that, I'm going to go back to a few slides. And again, I'm watching the chat window. If you have any questions, um, feel free to post. I'm going to give the, give the Adobe Connect a second for you and see if there are any questions. You All may right. need to no put questions. your mouse in the yes. upper corner to shrink that screen. Not you, Randy, but anybody in the audience who had that full that window full screen. Great. Looks like we have a question coming in. Hi, there's a question from Belinda regarding the ridge and valley areas of Tennessee. And um, I personally have not been working there. However, um, uh, Catherine Medlock of the Nature Conservancy has done some modeling work there alongside our colleague Greg Lowe. The modeling that I was uh, mentioning was done in Asheville. And I have done a little bit of work in the War Woman region of Georgia. And I um, hope to make it make it back to your part of the world again. Um, I, I find those ridge and valley areas to be very challenging with um, the, you know, the solar sort of play on the landscape and the elevation and moisture gradients is it's very interesting. Um, and Tom Ward has a question that, um, yeah, let, let me, I will answer that momentarily. That's a good question. And um, I don't know that species myself, but I'll, I'm going to quick take a look at that while you guys possibly get um, situated. Um, I do not see that in the mod. Oh, yes. Um, yes, Tom. Castanea dentata was um, uh, in a species that Milo Pine inserted for the whole biophysical setting. I do not see it as a representative or indicator species for any of the succession classes. So again, this represents um, reference conditions. And um, as we know, American chestnut would not be uh, an indicator species so much on the landscape today. So thanks so much for the questions. Keep them coming. So to get the models, um, you would do a couple things. First, you would go and download VDDT, Vegetation Dynamics Development Tool, or preferably STSIM. And again, um, I'll work with David to make sure you get the links for those. So you get the modeling software, get that um, installed. Then you go to landfire.gov, click on the vegetation button you see in the middle of the screen there, and work your way to this map where you can click on a map zone. And that will give you the PDF files that represent the descriptions for you to read. And then it will give you the Microsoft Access database that you would then work with in VDDT or STSIM. So again, David and I will work with you to um, make sure you get those links. And, and I'm always ready to help you as needed to dig into the models. So here are some basic uses of the models um, that, that I, I find to be very interesting. Um, exploring how these ecosystems work. You know, there's nothing better to get than to get ecologists together and just debate how these ecosystems work. And it's great to have those debates, but it's even better to put them into some sort of software where we can test each other's ideas out. You know, um, I love those conversations where somebody thinks fire occurred every 150 years and someone else says, no, I think it was every 250 years. Let's model it. Poof, I can make those changes in the model very quickly, run the model, get those percentages for the succession classes, and then we have something else to add to the discussion. And it may be that I entered in the numbers wrong, maybe the model's not built properly, or maybe um, we don't understand the ecosystem, or maybe the person that said 250 years is right. 
So um, anyways, it's a great way to understand the models. It's also a great way to document knowledge. Um, I can tell you that for my part of the world in the Great Lakes, we don't have great insect and pest information for the reference area. Um, or, or era, I should say. And I think that's true in several places across the country. Other disturbances are difficult to mo map and model as well. We can also test the sensitivity of these ecosystems to changes. So we can take a fire adapted ecosystem and we can turn off all fire or we can reduce fire by 80% to perhaps um, represent fire suppression and start seeing how the ecosystem responds over time. What might it look like in 100 years, 200 years, 20 years? Um, so it's, it's fairly easy to go in and, and, and play, so to speak. You can also throw in herbivory, which in my part of the world and um, with deer is a huge issue. Um, you can compare trends across regions. So um, you can look at how the ecosystems may have worked farther north or farther south. And a lot of times it means sort of um, making those jive with each other and, and you um, make, make assumptions and document as well. It enables mapping. So the process I've shown you and that our team did within Landfire, uh, we did not produce spatial outputs. However, the broader Landfire project took some of the outputs from our work and then did the mapping of historic fire regimes, for example, which is one of the Landfire data sets. Um, so it does play into mapping as well. And as I mentioned, um, it enables collaborative learning and conflict resolution, or reduction, I should say. I don't think it ever resolves it, but I'm going to go into these last two bullets with a couple examples for you. Um, people in my part of the world were, were curious about the um, annual acres of different types of fires. So by querying the disturbance information for the different ecosystems, out of the model database, I was then able to multiply that sort of the annual probabilities of different fires time the acreages of the different ecosystems to come up with estimates of how much fire there would have been per map zone per year prior to European settlement. And it was um it was a really great exercise and you'll see that um, in map zone 41 Minnesota there was a lot of fire and if I also, when you combine this with mixed fire and surface fire, you see there's, there's a lot of fire, millions of acres of fire annually. And this, this links up with um, other published estimates. And so it is possible to go in and sort of enable some more spatial sorts of work with these aspatial models. All right, so I've talked about this collaborative approach. And... Um, on the Cherokee National Forest, um, our, our colleague Catherine Medlock and another colleague Greg Lowe worked with stakeholders there. And it was basically a, a common situation I see across the country where there's a highly contentious stakeholder group um, with people that want to cut more, want to restore actively, ranging all the way to people who do not want to do anything on the ground and let nature take its course. And um, it makes it where um, our agency partners are, are really um, sort of handcuffed. They can't do anything. And so this was one of those situations. They formed the Cherokee National Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative to understand the ecosystems historically and their current conditions. And then they were able to explore return on investment of various management alternatives to manipulations of the land fire models. And in the end, they came up with recommendations for the Forest Service, which was a huge leap for this group to be able to together provide recommendations for the Forest Service. It was a, it was a, a big achievement. And here's sort of what this looks like. It's a fairly busy chart, but I'll walk you through it. On the left, you'll see the different ecological systems, including that co-forest that I just showed you. Um, and you see the red, yellow, and green boxes. Those represent the level of difference between current conditions and reference conditions. 
So for this example, reference conditions serve as a proxy for desired future conditions. Of course, there are tons of other considerations that um, the Cherokee National Forest has to work with. You know, there's timber values, there's recreation values, social values, um, rare and endangered species. So this was just one part of the puzzle. Um, but so if you have a green box, that means that the ecological departure or the difference between reference and current were reduced. And within an acceptable range, the red boxes weren't. You'll also see the columns um, titled things like no management with fire suppression, maximum ecological management. These are the different scenarios or alternatives for management that the stakeholders developed and had Greg Lowe, the modeler, test. So they wanted to test various management alternatives and they provided Greg with a cost per acre for the different types of treatments such as controlled burn, planting of different types, invasive treatment, salvage thinning after ice storms, that sort of thing. And with that, um, Greg was able to, to work with the partners to develop sort of the best strategy for each ecosystem based on sort of a return on investment. And this was all done in, at the time, VDDT, or Vegetation Dynamics Development Tool, and a pretty elegant Excel spreadsheet. So Greg, who is um, a, a very dynamic guy with an MBA, learned, learned the modeling software. And then he, he, through decades of experience, has enough sort of ecological know-how to work with partners. So it was a really great match. And I say that partly to um, demonstrate that, you know, he'll tell you anyone can can learn how to do this this level of modeling that's not spatial and that's really enabled by stakeholders. So um, Tom asked a great question, what's return on investment management? So this is where, <coughs> excuse me, if I remember correctly, and Tom, I'll have to um, provide a link to the report and to double check this, but typically that would be where they would play around to try to optimize return on investment. And um, it's at the time, it was a trial and error sort of thing. Now the software has, I believe, some optimization type func functions. At least there was there was word of that being developed. So again, that would be something I would have to double check on as I've not used that function myself. There was rumor of that being available now. So um, thanks for the great questions, Tom. And I'll, I'll have to provide a link to the report. It's, it was really great work by these folks. And I honestly do not remember the specifics of those scenarios. So here's, here's the land fire model summarized. They represent how the ecosystems of the United States worked prior to European settlement. There's the model in, in the software and the description. And I'll tell you that the description, as you take the land fire models and move forward with them, the description is the almost the more difficult part. It's easier, it seems, to hold a workshop and to play with the models, oddly, and then um, it's oftentimes takes a fair amount of follow-up to get the descriptions updated as well. Um, so I'll mention that. These, these models are not necessarily a prescription for how things should be today or tomorrow. Um, this is important to recognize, of course, as we have climate change, for, ex for example. Land fire does not model climate change. I believe that um, land fire products may, um, may complement your resiliency work or other types of, of climate change planning, but, but we do not provide that um, as part of the product set. When people deal with climate change using the land fire models, they will typically add new succession classes. For example, for that cove hardwood system, maybe they would add a new succession class that would represent the vegetation that might occur under a warmer, drier climate. They might also manipulate the disturbance regimes. So obviously going into the future, they would have to represent logging, fire suppression, other modern management activities, but they might also increase fire probabilities if they think that's appropriate, or they may increase pest outbreak to represent those um, potential effects of climate change. 
So I, I do believe Landfire can complement your climate change work. And I also think that for some situations, um, reference can, uh, a forest that's closer to reference conditions may be more resilient. Um, the most, I think, extreme example of this is out west where you have ponderosa pine forests. Those forests have become so uncharacteristically young and dense that when there is a fire, um, it, it burns so hot at times that the site no longer returns to ponderosa pine type site. And I believe there's analogs like that in the east as well, where reference conditions um, would mean more resilience. That's definitely not always the case, though. The models can be easily modified, and I know um, it's, it's easy for me to say that after I've worked with the models for a while, but I truly believe that's the case. And the Landfire team stands ready to help you do that work. We always need your expertise to help us understand how to parameterize the models. But if you need training or if you need someone to help drive the models in a workshop, we, we are ready to do that. Also, going into the future, um, this is a, a big plug for you. As I mentioned, the Landfire models, um, we believe always can be improved. We know there are, are ways they can be improved, and we're going to start a process to do that next year. We're going to take the roughly 1,800 models that currently exist, collapse duplicates or very similar models into roughly 1,000 models for the country. Then we're going to do a content review with folks like yourselves to catch blunders that may be in the models and to add any new um, information that we might have and to just check the logic of them and make sure that they are as good as they can be. We also hope to improve the delivery of them. For example, now we don't have really a searchable web database where you can go in and look for all the models with yellow birch or American chestnut, for example. We'd like to provide that to you as well. So. Um, it's, this is sort of a plea to, to you all. We hope that you will help us in this review, and we also hope to get your feedback on landfire.gov. There's a, a questionnaire right now that you can fill out to help us improve Landfire products. If you have ideas on how we can better deliver the models or better train you to use the models, we're, we, we would love to hear that. So I wanted to um, show you the team that I work with. Uh, we are, again, a small part of the larger land fire program. We have Jim Smith in your part of the world. He's in Jacksonville, Florida, though right now he's got his coat on in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He has tons of experience working with um, agencies and industrial land management companies. He um, was also in the academic world for 15 years. So he brings a, a great deal of experience Corey Blankenship is in Oregon. She is developing a method to add ranges to those percentages. As we know, um, any one succession class would probably not have 4%, but it would range from 3 to 7%. And she's developing some robust methods to add a range. <coughs> Excuse me, there's myself. Um, Sarah Hagen is our spatial analyst, and she does a lot of GIS work, obviously. And then Jeannie Patton, who's on the call, is um, sort of the co-conspirator in this WebEx with David and I. And she is the one who can help us find any information on Landfire. And she co coordinates all of our communications work and um, knows our library of resources better than anyone. So please, please feel free to contact us at any time. You can, you can email landfire at tnc.org. That'll go to Jeannie, who will then answer the question or pass it off to the appropriate people, either on our team or in the Greater Landfire Program. So um, we're, we're, we're very eager to work with you whenever possible. There are tons of resources online. Um, I, I, I hope I haven't um, frustrated you too much, which is just such a cursory introduction to the Landfire Program or the models. But um, you can go online to any of these resources and learn more. You can go to landfire at tnc.org to get on our mailing list as well. And um, I hope that you will contact us soon or check out those resources. Also, you can, I'll really um, encourage you to go to landfire.gov or to the Conservation Gateway um, to find more information. And with that, I'll, um, 
I'll take any questions or if you'd like for me to open up the modeling software again and play around some more, show you how that works, I'm, I'm happy to do all that. Whatever is helpful for you and thanks so much for participating. Well, thanks so much, Randy. Uh, we still definitely have some time left in our hour, so if, if y'all still have uh, questions or, or comments for Randy, uh, please go ahead and put those in. It looks like we already got one from Tom. You see that there? All right, Tom Ward asked a really great question um, relative to ecological site descriptions. Um, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Tom. I, I should have brought that up myself. So as you, uh, many of you know, the NRCS is developing ecological site descriptions. And within that ecological site descriptions, they will also have a state and transition model. Um, and Tom or anyone else, feel free to correct me if, if I'm not exactly right here. But those state and transition models that fit within their ecological site descriptions mostly focus on current conditions. However, they do have a reference condition state, as far as I understand. And so we're working with NRCS in various places across the country to see, first, we, we know we can learn tons from the NRCS. Um, Landfire is always looking for, um, for example, a plot data. But also in our CS folks, um, you just have tons of soil and, and ecological background that, that we can learn from to better map and model. We're also hoping that we can contribute to their work. Um, if nothing else, we've been through the, the joys and tribulations of national sort of descriptive work. So we understand in some ways what, what they're doing. Um, and, and also maybe you know, we can contribute to their work. So thanks so much for asking that, Tom. All right, Tom has another great question. Um, I think it's a statement, and and I'll I'll take it maybe as a question though. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with state and transition modeling, he asked um, state and trans or, or note state and transition models are dynamic through time and space. So, <laughs> um, it's a really good point. So in our modeling with land fire, we assumed the same probability for a disturbance every time step. We know that that is not the case necessarily. For example, insect outbreaks are very cyclical. You know, you'll have um, spruce budworm will not be around for a long time, then poof, all of a sudden it shows up and you've got a bunch. It's not the same probability every year. But to get our reference percentages, we ran the models for a thousand years and the assumption is after a while everything sort of equilibrates but if you were modeling for a shorter time span say 20 or 50 years or you needed to do something more along the lines of management and needed a better model you could change the probabilities over time for example you may know that um, uh, a particular insect outbreak occurs every seven years you can model for that or maybe you can um, add in fire trends over time maybe you expect that your fire program will grow and you'll be doing more control burns over time so you can increase the control burns over time so you can make it dynamic over time though in land fire we did not Randy, I had a question on, on STSIM. What's the next step for people who are interested in learning how to use that tool? There's a couple things. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen again, and um, I'll show you what I would do. So here's landfire.gov, and as I mentioned, um, there's the vegetation button and you can go into the vegetation dynamics models. You would go there, get the package that Landfire delivers for your map zone. Then you would download, you would go to apexrms.com and download STSIM, which is, which is here. Then you can go into, they have a, a wiki site 
and they have a forum. So they, when you get STSIM, you get a, um, you actually get a database, a sample database of data. You can start playing around, and that's what I would do. You can't break it. So I would download STSIM, download the, um, I believe if, if you click on here, you'll get more information. So here you can download it. Then you can download the, the sample models and, and just go in and start exploring and, and poking around as if you were a little kid almost. My wife teaches kids in technology and she says that that's the best way to learn is just start poking around. Especially with a sample database, you can't do anything wrong. You can always go get it again. Um, so that's what I would do. Um, there are some steps involved in going from the Landfire package to STSIM. As you remember, Landfire developed the models in VDDT. Um, so if you want to use the Landfire models in STSIM, either contact us or if you join the forum, there's a great description, sort of a tutorial on how to make that transition. So that's what I would do. And that forum, is that the forum on the Apex page? Yes. Okay. And um, you do have to sign in, but it's a, you know, Leonardo, Fred, and Colin Daniel are very, very active. They're the ones who sort of run Apex system modeling support. So you usually get questions and answers pretty quickly. And um, yeah, I would, I would give it a go. Cool. Thank you. Any other yeah. questions from the audience? No? All right. Well, I'm going to switch format to you, Randy, and pull up Sounds our feedback page. So it looks like we're pretty much run up to the end of our hour. Thanks so much, Randy. That was an outstanding presentation, and uh, I thought you did a really nice job of, of switching over to actually show us the software in action. Um, we've only done that at one other time that I can think of with our webinars, and I, th I think it worked really well. Mm -hmm.